Good morning. This is Ron. It is Friday, June the 1st. Welcome to Storytime. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, this is Ron, your host, the only man who is the uh, true, uh, who the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I am the only person who makes the presumption for the status quo. Okay, so um, I was when I was growing up, and as I've mentioned in previous broadcasts, I was in a foster home, and uh, we used to have, and it was a socialist household. It was run like a socialist. A regime, and uh, one of the things that was that made it socialist was punishment. The way punishment was uh, meted out, um, and the, the way that it was done was based on it was power oriented. That uh, the not right and wrong. They did not uh, set definitions. They didn't define their terms. They didn't set up uh, make agreements uh, in terms of what uh, kind of transgressions were going to. Uh, be met with what kind of punishment. For instance, if you uh, don't do your homework, you don't get any dessert tonight, that kind of thing. Uh, So, uh, again, everything was arbitrary. It all depended on um, how threatened they felt by your behavior, uh, the kind of mood that they were in. So you had situations where you do something, you figured, I'm in big, big, big trouble, and they blow it off. They'd say, okay, well, I'm sure you learned your lesson. Bye. And then other uh, situations in which it was, uh, you would assume a fairly minor trans, uh, transgression and uh, therefore get a, uh, you know, just a, a mild reproach and uh, you would end up getting beaten, uh, you know, uh, quite severely for it. So, and that's all because of, they refuse to, you know, define terms and whatnot because it's all about power. See, the whole thing is with the socialists, and you'll notice with this with socialists in your life, is that they will uh, engage you in various types of conversations without defining their terms. And so what that leaves them with is the uh, what's called plausible deniability. You can say to them, oh, well, you said X, Y, Z, and they can always say, well, no, I didn't. Um, uh, or you'll hear them say a lot of times, that's not what I meant. And it's, you can't call them on it because you haven't gotten a definition. So uh, they can use words in their connotative rather than their denotative sense. Denotative meaning literal. So if you say cool, it refers uh, to temperature. If you're using it connotatively, then it, re- it refers to attitude. So um, you have to make sure when you're dealing with socialists to get definitions. Uh, when you say uh, uh, homeless, Exactly what do you mean? Because uh, very often homelessness uh, changes with, uh, you know, whatever uh, the socialist agenda is. There were, usually you would think homeless meaning somebody that is dirty, filthy, living on the street uh, day after day for uh, weeks, months, well, beyond weeks and months, but years. Uh, and there are those on the left that say be, living in a hotel is homelessness. Living in a hotel or motel is homelessness. And uh, so that's why you always have to get a definition so that they can be tied down. If they won't define their terms, then you have to abandon the conversation. Um, You'll say something to them like, uh, when you feel like having a conversation, let me know. Have a nice day and walk away or hang up the phone as appropriate. So uh, that way you can uh, keep them from uh, turning everything into a power game. Uh, a lot of times you can do try to do that in work situations with your bosses. Um, it's a little trickier, a little bit more difficult to do so. So it's a lot more stressful for you if you have a boss uh, that's making arbitrary uh, claims or demands on you and you want to be able to um, uh, make sure that those, uh, turn those claims around and make sure, sh- or, or those demands, make sure that those demands are uh, solid, understood, and that the boss is not going to be able to wiggle out of his uh, responsibilities in, in terms of those uh, um, uh, demands. So, but even though it's stress-producing, it's a good it's good to try it just as an eye opener. Find out where your boss is really coming from. 
Um, you know, if your boss is making these arbitrary demands and always has a tendency to uh, be in the right even when he's in the wrong, uh, then you can sit down with him and, and try to get him to define his terms and see if he'll do it. The people that are power-oriented, that are socialistic, are, are going to avoid doing that. And the more you press them on it, the more angry they will get. Uh, they will start to become snarling and nasty, particularly if they're in a supervisory um, position, if they have a position of power. So, But it's interesting to do that just to see. Uh, and if it is, uh, maybe it's a good idea to try to find another job within the company you're working or find maybe another company to work for uh, altogether because uh, otherwise your life is probably going to be very, very it, unnecessarily stressful. Well, let's put it that way. So, and um, so my foster parents ended up being people that were uh, pretty much impossible to deal with. You just couldn't, not only me, but there's other adults that had a, a tough time dealing with uh, my foster parents. And uh, so uh, after I uh, grew up and uh, left home, I've had uh, nothing to do with them for decades uh, because what's the point? Uh, go over to their house and they'd be subjected to uh, arbitrary demands and claims and uh, whatnot. Uh, who needs it? You know, I'm an adult now. And as they were, were always fond of saying, hey, you know, this is our house. In other words, we're in power, we're in charge. And um, uh, you do what we want you to do. And uh, when you become an adult, then you get to do what you want to do. Of course, they didn't mean that because uh, when I became an adult, I was still hearing from them, hey, how come you haven't sent us a Christmas card? Gee, go figure. So when I come back, it's going to be, um, I'm going to be reading from the Anglican Theological Review. Okay, well, thank you very much, and we're back, and I'm going to be reading from the fall 2017 uh, issue, volume 99, number four, I guess volume 99, that means it's been around for a while, of the uh, Anglican Theological Review, and this is going to be uh, the section of, uh, let's see, is this chapter one? Uh, well, it's uh, actually just a section called Theological Interpretation, Second Naivete, and the Rede Rediscovery of the Old Testament. And this uh, subsection is called Six Factors Underlying Theological Interpretation. Perhaps the best keynote for theological interpretation is the famous words of Paul Ricoeur, Beyond the desert of criticism we wish to be called again. Modern scholarly criticism, while legitimate, can become arid. How then can one re-engage existentially with the Bible in its classic significance, a place of encounter with God, without abandoning scholarly integrity? This is not the place to try to do justice to the weighty overer of Ricoeur, who, along with uh, Hans George Gadamer, has been a major figure in rethinking the interpretation of texts in ways that fundamentally shift the contours of modern biblical criticism. But we must recognize his importance in articulating the possibility of being called again in a way that does not deny, but both incorporates and moves beyond typical modern scholarly concerns. Thus the notion of a second naivete. In general terms, a first naivete means taking things, in this context the Bible and faith, straightforwardly at face value. Critical reflection, when undertaken, probes and discovers difficulties. Although this is a valid undertaking, it can have the effect of neutralizing the existential significance of what is scrutinized. Ricoeur's achievement is to show how one can validly regain a living existential engagement with what one critically scrutinizes, not least the Old Testament. The second naivete is sometimes called a post-critical naivete, which is unfortunate and misleading because it is not about ceasing to be critical, but about becoming critical in a different mode and by different criteria. Nonetheless, because interpreters with a second naivete can take the recognition of certain problems for granted and so no longer linger on them, 
they can at times sound similar to those who, still in their first naivete, have not yet really recognized the problems in the first place. One may need to attend carefully to what is and is not said and to how it is said if one is to discern the difference between the two naivetes. A second factor underlying theological interpretation is the growth of literary approaches to the biblical text. Where once literary criticism meant source criticism, it now refers to genuinely literary modes of reading. For example, the concept of the narrator, a literary category, may replace questions about the author, a historical category, and a concern with intertextuality, significant resonances between texts that may be unintended by, any, unintended by anyone, may displace concern with allusion or citation, matters of author, authorial intention. A landmark work was Robert Alter's The Art of Biblical Narrative. It suddenly became possible to see how one could read narratives as meaningful literary wholes, even if in compositional terms, they might be composite. The whole can be more than the sum of its parts and can be meaningful precisely as a whole. Since this approach has now become well established, it is easy to forget the initial impact it made on readers trained for several generations to read Pentateuchical, Pentateuchical narratives, in particular, with questions uppermost in mind about the source or redaction to which any verse might best be ascribed. In its own way, this enabled a second naivete mode of reading. Another characteristic of literary approaches is the rediscovery of the importance of the imagination in interpretation. Although Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment thinkers had often viewed the imagination negatively as essentially akin to whim or fantasy as opposed to the responsible use of reason, it now became possible to see the imagination as an integral element in good interpretation. Of course, the imagination must be instructed and used in a disciplined way. Nonetheless, to affirm the importance of the imagination is to recognize the open-ended nature of the interpretation of great and resonant literature, such as is abundantly found in the Old Testament. When the imagination is theologically informed, it also becomes possible to re-engage with great pre-modern readers from the fathers onward and freshly situate contemporary interpretation in an enduring Christian conversation about the meaning of Scripture. A third factor in the rediscovery of the importance of the role of the reader in interpretation. If historical critical work is the priority, the role of the interpreter is construed as being akin to a judge in a law court. The task is to attend to all the evidence, to weigh and sift it with critical insight, and not allow one's own preferences to skew an honest evaluation of the evidence. Disciplined and informed reason with appropriate use of the imagination should be the prime characteristic of the good interpreter. This is indeed valuable, yet it has come to be recognized that with all significant writing in the human humanities that probes deep issues of human life, an ability to understand the nature of existential issues is important for good interpretation. Thus, in addition to considering the text in its formative context of her origin, it becomes important also to consider the interpreter's formative context. One of the ways theological interpretation differs from more conventional theology of the Old or New Testament is that accent is laid on the quality of insight and inter interpreters are able to bring to the biblical text in order the better uh, to articulate the nature of the theological and existential subject matter about which the text speaks. This regularly involves a grasp of paradox and mystery. Being at home with this is also a mark of second naivete. A fourth factor underlying theological interpretation is the influence of a remarkable and concentrated flourishing of Christian scholarship a generation ago at Yale Divinity School. Sometimes reference is made to this as the Yale School, though the key protagonists tended not to think of themselves in such a way. What marked the Yale scholars in one way or another were attempts to escape the increasingly arid debates between liberals and conservatives that determined so much of biblical and theological scholarship in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
and instead to rethink and reshape how rigorous and faithful biblical and theological scholarship might otherwise be undertaken. Among the well-known figures are Brevard Childs in Old Testament, Paul Miniar in New T Testament, George Lindbeck in Systemic Theology, and Hans Fry in Theology and Hermeneutics. More recently, some of the scholars at Duke Divinity School have continued what was begun at Yale, among the best known of whom are Stanley Kurwas in Theology and Ethics, Richard Hayes in New Testament, and Ellen Davis and Stephen Chapman in Old Testament. For our purposes, the key figure is Brevard Childs, who articulated a canonical approach to the Old Testament, a historical critical approach as practiced by most mainstream scholars, is characterized by studying the Bible as a collection of ancient documents that are to be understood precisely as ancient documents, whose sense is determined by philo uh, philological and historical questions about likely meaning in antiquity, irrespective of how the material came to be read subsequently by Jews and Christians. By contrast, a canonical approach is characterized by studying the Bible as the book of the church, where the historic and continuing context of reception and appropriation should properly make a difference to how the biblical documents are best interrogated, understood, and appropriated. Child's canonical approach in no way denies the value of historical critical analysis of the biblical documents, but rather takes its methods and findings for granted, seeks to move beyond them, and recontextualizes the interpretive inquiry as a whole. Again, this approach envisages a mode of second naivete for reading the biblical text. Childs uses the term canon and canonical as shorthand for a variety of concerns and processes involved in privileging the biblical documents and preserving them to be authoritative for future generations who live beyond the context of the document's origin. In the first instance, this involved processes of editing and framing the material. The final, received form of the text is seen to be meaningful in its own right, as in literary approaches. Moreover, a canonical collection creates its own literary context. The constituent documents are recontextualized and can now be read in juxtaposition with documents that have been unknown to the original authors, but that may nonetheless be illuminating for understanding their subject matter. The continuing life of the Jewish and Christian communities for whom these documents have always been authoritative, created modes of reading that often probe the subject matter of the text in profound, if sometimes surprising ways, and also offered wide-ranging synthetic understandings of how the material as a whole should best be understood and appropriated. Understandings that still inform and underlie contemporary understandings and appropriations in both synagogue and church. A fifth factor, fifth factor underlying theological interpretation is the growth of Jewish contributions to biblical scholarship. Historical critical scholarship has often been as uninterested in and dismissive of Jewish interpretation as of Christian interpretations. Rabbis and fathers alike were ingenious but operated with interpretive assumptions that could no longer be taken seriously. Consequently, some Jewish scholars have wanted to operate in straightforward historical critical mode where religious identity becomes irrelevant and the interpretation of the biblical material in its ancient context of origin prior to the advent of both Judaism and Christianity becomes the scholarly concern. But some Jewish scholars have been seeking their own mode of a second naivete, in which justice can be done to the biblical documents, both in their context of origin and in their reception and appropriation by Judaism. Neither confusing nor conflating these tasks yet interested in the real continuities between them. The most articulate voice here has been that of John Levinson at Harvard Divinity School. In a series of brilliant essays on biblical hermeneutics, Levinson both illuminated and reframed the overall interpretive task. One of the best known of these essays, quote, why Jews are not interested in biblical theology, unquote, has sometimes been misread as a dismissal of biblio biblical theolo theology altogether, when in fact Levinson's concern is to critique the tendency of Christians to covertly utilize Christian theological assumptions and yet present their work as though they were simply articulating the plain sense of the biblical text, 
Levinson seeks greater awareness and better hermeneutic, hermeneutical understanding in the interpretive task. His own work offers fine examples of biblical theology where Israel's scriptures are seen to be illuminated by the specific readings of Jewish tradition alongside other readings. A sixth factor is the growth of ideological approaches to the Old Testament, of which feminism is the best known. Unlike conventional historical critical approaches, which seek, in principle, to bracket out contemporary concerns, feminist approaches tend to prioritize readings of the text in relation to contemporary concerns for justice and gender equality. They can often function as a secular version of a rule of faith, the classic Christian sense that a reading of the biblical text should be informed by a wide-ranging sense of how things go. On any reckoning, all scholars, whether or not explicitly feminist, must take seriously the emancipation of women in Western culture in the modern period, which leads to women having roles that were simply not envisaged by the biblical writers in their assumptions and prescriptions about daily life. There are also ideological approaches that question assumptions that biblical interpreters have characteristically made. For example, biblical scholars have generally treated the biblical deity as God, not just a God. While Zeus or Marduk may be written off as no more than constructs of the ancient imagination, the Lord is considered, with whatever qualifications, to be the one true God. By, but, why, but why should this assumption be made in a post-Christendom culture? Why should the Lord be regarded differently from Zeus or Marduk? When scholars like David Kleins push such a question, it is salutary for those who are theologically concerned to have to articulate afresh the grounds for privileging the biblical portrayal of the God of Israel. In each of these six factors, which I suggest set the context for contemporary theological interpretation, I've highlighted the notion of a second naivete. This, in my judgment, is the key factor that enables a renewed Christian confidence in reading and appropriating Israel's pre-Christian scriptures as Christian scripture, a fundamental resource for understanding God and the life of faith today. Where Wellhausen solely saw an insoluble conflict between scientific work and the practical task of Christian service, it is now possible to combine the two with not only intellectual, but also moral and spiritual integrity. Another way of putting the issue is that the historical awareness that Israel's scriptures should be understood to be meaningful in their pre-Christian context is more hermeneutically uninteresting than sometimes realized. For it becomes clear that these documents of ancient Israel, precisely because they were privileged and preserved as authoritative for future generations, can be legitimately and responsibly read in more than one way. A classic Christian mode of reading in which Israel's scriptures are read in relation to Jesus Christ may yet be meaningful if one is open to imaginative, figurative, and poetic ways, as well as ancient historical ways of reading. The historical critical concern to read these uh, texts as expressive of the religious thought of Israel and Judah, albeit the selected and privileged thought, which may not have been that which was found everywhere in Israel and Judah, has been greatly illuminating. The recognition that Israel's scriptures have a historic and continuing reception in Judaism means that there are conceptual and existential resources for reading that are not Christian, but from which Christians can learn and be enriched. A key challenge for Christians today is to preserve that space and tension between the pre-Christian and Christian meaning of the material, neither sundering nor conflating these distinct frames of references. For in that way, it becomes possible also to make space for the Jewish frame of reference. It is not that anything goes, for in each frame of reference, there are legitimate constraints that inform responsible understanding and use. Nonetheless, these ancient texts are meaningful in more than one context and more than one way. And that was the uh, second subsection. Uh, next time the subsection will be alternative understandings of theological interpretation. And again, as I've said in the past, the reason that I read this is because uh, for beauty. It's absolutely beautifully written and because it is um, uh, count, runs counter to American counterculture. American counterculture places emphasis on communicating 
um, between uh, people uh, w with the use of storytelling and uh, verbal picture painting. And th what I've been reading is none of that. There was no, no stories in there. There was no verbal picture painting. It was uh, purely conceptual, excuse me, and abstract. And uh, so uh, that is modern. That's the way modern man is. Prehistoric man was uh, the kind of uh, human that uh, communicated by telling stories and uh, picture and painted pictures, usually on the wall of caves. And what's funny is that, again, this is a tool of the left, but the left is the one that always claims to be um, ahead of conservatives, that can, trying to paint conservatives as uh, being um, troglodytes and cavemen and backwards, and that the uh, people on the left are the ones that are truly progressive, yet uh, they keep trying to drive us backwards in so many different ways, and uh, one of them is, of course, in the way we communicate. So I, I like to uh, read something like this, again, to remind people the importance of uh, the conceptual and the abstract and so that people can uh, get an appreciation for the beauty of uh, reading and writing uh, uh, conceptually and abstractly. Uh, it's something you have to get used to because, again, if you're used to reading something, you know you're going to read something and you're waiting for a story to be told, told or a picture to be painted, um, then it's kind of confusing. But after you get used to the idea that, hey, there's not going to be any stories, not going to be any pictures, uh, this is going to be strictly conceptual and abstract, then you start to understand and uh, not get it, but understand, truly understand what's going on. And you see the beauty of how the concepts are formed, how the, uh, the grammar and uh, the logic and the rhetoric of it, I guess, is the best way to put it. So... Uh, in any case, that uh, wraps up this episode of Storytime, and until next time, thank you very much for joining me, and have a great day.